gotta keep your head up. That was Keep Your Head Up by Tupac. Kumusta barkada kol. Hello, my friends. You are listening to XLR, Lando University Radio. What's up? This is Tupac with your ates, Scotty Rocket and Lauren Deschanel. We've got a special surprise for you today. Hello, hello. Let's keep going. Lauren, say hi. Hi. Welcome back to Tupac. Welcome to class. All right. Now, October is Filipino American History Month. This is a celebration of Filipino American history, in case you couldn't tell, and it's in the month of October because this com uh, commemorates the first recorded presence of Filipinos in the continental United States, which occurred in October 18, uh, 1587 to be exact. Lauren, what are we gonna be going over today? We are going over some Filipino American history and talking about how being a Filipino American is a unique experience mm -hmm. from just Filipino or just American. Yes, it's, it's quite different. Our little surprise that we have for you guys today is our very first guest on this show, Professor Monique Sakai Bagwell. Professor Bagwell is not only a Filipino American, but also happens to be our only POC professor in our department here at Lander. POC, that sounds familiar. Lauren, what is this show? Tupac. How do you spell Tupac? Number two, POC, because we are two people of color. Three people of color today. Three Pac. Three Pac. So, Professor Bagwell, thank you. Welcome to Three Pac. We're going to go ahead. I am so honored to be here. Seriously, what an honor. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, for being here. We, we're very happy that you're here. Thank you so much. We are so honored to have you as our first guest. Yes, absolutely, yes. absolutely. Thank you. Excited, yes. Okay, well, let me get this going. Now, first we're going to go ahead and introduce you a little more by asking you some questions and, you know, just just getting to know you a little more. A little more. Sure. I'm not sure. All right, so first off, what is your cultural background or your cultural identity? What, what's up there? Hmm, I gotta tell you, you know, like just, just, just the simple, the simple identity would say I'm or Asian because I'm half Filipino and half American. But, you know, the truth of the matter is what is an American? Mm -hmm. you know? And so that American also has its own uh, variety and mix. So, you know, coming from my mother's side, I have Russian, I have Polish Jewish, I have German and Dutch. So, oh. you know, there's a real hodgepodge right there as well. Gotcha, gotcha, cool, thank you. Cool. Thank you, and um, where, where in the Philippines is your Filipino side from? I was born in uh, Quezon City. Oh. Mm-hmm, and I lived in the Philippines uh, for about four years. And if, if, we're, if we're looking at like at a province, you know, what would your province mm -hmm. be? Yeah. It would probably be rooted in my father's uh, province, which would be Los Banos. Oh, cool, 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 cool. Nice. Nice. So um, you kind of touched on this, but how would you say that you define yourself now? Like, what do you say when people ask the what question? The what are you question. We talked about this last mm -hmm. week, actually. That is a microaggression in a sense, but what? we won't get into that. <laughs> yeah. When people ask the, the good old what are you question, what, what's your first response? Uh, well, my first response would be that I am an independent woman who loves like, no, I'm only kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, my first response would be that, simply that I'm, I'm Amer Asian or Filipino American, you know, like I said, mm -hmm. that would be the, the simplest response. And, you know, and I can, I, I didn't hear your last episode, so I, I'm not sure, you know, what the response was on that when people ask you, but, you know, if you think about it in all fairness, I would rather have somebody ask me, mm -hmm. what are you, than, mm -hmm. than make an assumption. Yeah. Right, cool. uh, and, in, in, and it's just out of curiosity and uh, it, it means that, huh, oh, well, you know, where are you from? You know, I, and trust me, you know, coming here in the South, that's like the number one question. Everybody asks you yeah. whether or not you're, uh, a person of color or anything, as soon as you open your mouth and you don't sound like you're from the South, I always get, 
oh, you're not from around here. Where are you? I you that. know. So it's it's really just, hey, wh who's coming here? You know, it, it's more like understanding the diversity. So mm -hmm. I, I try to be forgiving. My only time I'm not forgiving if somebody has like, um, you know, a stereotype that they're connecting me to. I could still be forgiving. You know, I could still be gracious, but I will make a mental note of it. <laughs> mental note. Love that. Microaggressions part two. Microaggressions part two. We love that. Thank you. Always providing content for our lovely show here. Oh, we should make a blog post about a that. A whole blog post on that. Thank <laughs> you, you so about. much. Well, Lauren, we're going to go ahead and transition. Okay. We're going to go ahead and take a break. Stay tuned because coming up, we will be discussing Pinoy population and community. We'll be right back with Tupac on XLR Lander University Radio. Welcome back. You are listening to Tupac with your girls, Lauren Deschanel and Scotty Rocket. Quick recap. We are in our last week of October, which is what? Filipino American History Month. So today we have a fellow Panay American in the studio, quote unquote, to talk to us. Professor Bagwell, say hi. Hey, Mabuhai. Yes, Mabuhai. Yes. <laughs> uh, don't you guys, you know, Inform the people of what you just said and what language that is. That is Tagalog. That is like uh, the, the big language of the Philippines. Now, the Philippines has a lot, a lot of languages going on. That's right. That's right. We have a lot of different dialects. In fact, yeah. some islands within the Philippines don't even understand each other. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I know my family goes from Ilocano to Tagalog, and it's very, very all over the place. And so... I'll ask my mom, mom, can you teach me something? And she's like, okay, do you want to know Tagalog or Ilocano? And I'm like, which one can I use most often? <laughs> so, so, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, so, and Mabuhay uh, is kind of, what? Go ahead, tell, tell her what Mabuhay is. <laughs> Mabuhay is kind of like this, like, like fun celebratory greeting, like, eh, kind of thing. Yeah, like, like aloha, you know, yes. might be to uh, a, a Hawaiian, aloha, you know, it's like, aloha. Mabuhay, it's like, yes. great to see you type yes. of thing. Yes. But what were you saying? What was I saying? About yeah. what? About when we, uh, we like jumbled into each other. <laughs> uh, no, no, that, that you were right about the fact that there are different dialects within, within the country. And Tagalog was just sort of, I, I don't know who, when it was exactly accepted as the national language mm -hmm. of the country. Mm -hmm. But um, I know there's some folks who do not speak Tagalog, eh, a little sensitive about that, you know, but that was the language they, they picked, uh, mm -hmm. Tagalog, and it is probably maybe 
the most spoken, at least on the mainland, right? Yeah. On the mainland. Yeah. And, and I believe, it does, isn't there like a 1,700 different islands, apparently, yes. that make up the Philippines? Yes, we there's have three the, main ones. Mm -hmm. But there's That's, like so uh, many. Luzon and where else? Um, Sayas and... Oh, I'm going cl to cut this audio because I am uninformed right this minute. <laughs> I feel like it's... <laughs> Here, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, Google. What are the three main islands... Of the Philippines. <laughs> We're totally gonna be okay. Oh, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. I was Mindanao, thinking. Mindanao, yes. 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 All right. So, do you happen to speak Tagalog? Kunti Long. I am more like Taglish. You know, gotcha. yeah. I could probably understand it more in context of something else than I could really speak it fluently. I did as a child. Yeah. I was definitely bilingual as a child. Love that. I love that. I cannot. I have a few words that I can convince someone that I know what I'm talking about, but I can't actually speak it. I know. It's frustrating. I wish I could. I yeah. Really I could. Absolutely. So we have cool things like Mabuhay. Yeah. Mabuhay! <laughs> Mabuhay! Yes. <laughs> but anyway, moving on with the show. <laughs> Right now, we are discussing community and how it relates to identity. The United States is actually home to the most Filipino immigrants. But the uh, Filipino Americans are also actually the second largest Asian American group in the nation. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Learn little things every day. That's why this is class. That's why this is class. We also call our show class. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it's educational. Yeah, I get it. Yes, we, we usually do a roll call. If you guys are listening, we're not doing roll call today because this is pre-recorded. We are not live. We are not live. We are alive and it's not live. Oh, yeah. sad. Because you might have had some Filipinos, but you know, I'll tell my family and they'll log in and they'll Yes. Yeah. Feel free to message us on our Instagram account or yes. through the Radio FX app. Yes, we will be in the station, you know, listening to ourselves live. So nice. <laughs> nice. Oh, our Instagram and all of our social media accounts are at 2POCXLR. Yes. So hit us up. But moving on. So we just said there's a lot of Filipinos here in America. A lot. Growing up in America, did you get to interact with many other Filipinos? Um, that's a good question. Uh, as a child, I don't recall that much interaction. You know, I grew up in New York. I grew up in Brooklyn specifically. And uh, we were probably the only Filipinos on the block, but that's not to say the block itself wasn't diverse because, you know, we had Jewish families, Italian families, Irish families, Russian families, you know. Uh, we, we had a whole gamut of different people that lived on our specific block. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were probably the only Filipinos. And even growing up, I remember when I was in middle school, I only met one other uh, student, you know, my age, who was, who was Filipino American. So uh, for whatever reason, we didn't, uh, we didn't have as many in the, in the area that I lived, but that's not to say in the city part, you know, in, in New York or Queens or some other borough of New yeah. York that, that there weren't more Filipinos, but just in my neighborhood in, in general, yeah. not so much. I mean, there were other Asians, but they were not, I don't recall, you know, meeting too many Filipinos unless they came to us to visit from somewhere else. Yeah. You know, like they were just in town visiting New York, something like that. But yeah, yeah, no, not, not so much. Yeah. Cause I know, um, for me growing up, I didn't have like a lot of Filipino kids in my school or like in my classes or anything, but we had like, I, uh, spent a lot of time in Charlotte and then grew up in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And we had like, uh, just like cliques of Filipinos who we made it a point to hang out because we were Filipino. Um, and so I mentioned this in a previous episode before, but I went to a church called FICC, which was uh, Filipino International. And sorry, mom, I know you told me <laughs> what the whole thing stood for, but yeah, it was very concentrated Filipinos and in Rock Hill, my mom had like some friends from back home who we all just happened to move to Rock Hill. 
And so we would hang out a lot with them growing up. Um, I don't get to hang out with a lot of Filipinos anymore, and that's on land feuds or stuff like that. But I, I, I had a lot of a lot of Filipinos growing up, so it. I guess it's just wherever pockets you are. Exactly. You know? Not exactly. that there weren't Filipinos around. They just, yeah. like you just said, it, it, it. Filipinos, like other cultures, tend to form pockets. You know yeah. where where they tend to to grow and mature and and populate. You know, but in in that particular neighborhood that I lived in, we were a real hodgepodge of different cultures, religions, all of that. You know, whereas mm-hmm. in New York, you can actually go from one side of the street to the next and be in a totally different world. I mean, perfect example would be Chinatown and Little yeah. Italy. Little Italy. Yeah. I mean, just cross one one block over. And you feel like you've just been transported to another country, you know, because it's just so saturated in that particular culture. But, you know, where I grew up, I didn't have that. And so, um, so I kind of missed out on some things. However, you know, I will say this, my family, you know, was really good about, um, you know, uh, recognizing that we were also half Filipino. So I was always surrounded by things that were from the Philippines, you know, like my mom had a lot of artwork, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, and of course my dad would visit, you know, us and, and that was always a big deal when he'd come to, to see us from the Philippines when he was in the States. Uh, my grandparents as well were world travelers and had a lot of artwork as well from the Philippines. So, you know, we, we, we were sensitive to that, to that, to that fact. And, and I even remember my mom taking me to a very special uh, dance concert. I want to say it was at the Lincoln Center or I can't remember quite where it was, but it was the Bayanihan. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. That's where they do the the, the uh, bamboo sticks, the tiki, gosh, I can't remember the name of that, where they clamp down on the on the bamboo yes, the, whole, the whole dance. The I can't remember. Yeah. And oh. they have to, and the women put their feet in between before they get smashed (laughs) yes it's like this whole really cool dance yeah yeah, and it gets faster and faster and faster and faster it's like a folk dance you know the men sit there and they clank on these bamboo sticks and these women walk around with these very delicate umbrellas looking very elegant and they step you know into the rhythm of of these bamboo clanking sticks and my my mom said that she remembers watching one i think it was probably in the philippines and she saw somebody's ankles get caught like she saw, Ooh. boom, the bamboo sticks, you know, got the act, the, the dancer. And she said she ma- maintained perfect poise and she kept going. Mm-hmm. You know? But I'm sure in her mind, she was probably screaming with pain, you know, oh. God, ouch. But yeah, so, so they can get hurt. But, you know, what's the difference between a professional and amateur? Professional doesn't let you know. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> And that's on Professor Bagwell being a performer. At all times. Correct. At all times. We admire that. Yes. <laughs> but we're actually going to pick up on this conversation again. Don't, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Class, don't go anywhere. Class is still in session. Class is still in session. We're going to be right back with Tupac here on what? XLR, Lander University Radio. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome back to class. You are listening to Tupac with your girls, Lauren Deschanel and Scotty Rocket. As stated at the top of the hour, we are celebrating Filipino American History Month. We have our voice professor here at Lander University, Professor Monique Saikai Bagwell, a Filipino American, to share and swap experiences with. Yes, hello, hello, hello. Professor Bagwell, would you like to say hi again? Mabuhay, maganda ng gabi. Yes. Yes. Love that. Oh, love we love it. this. All right, so earlier we were talking about Filipino American history, how population and community relates to identity. So we're going to go ahead and pick back up on that conversation. Lauren? How strongly would you say you identify with your Filipino side? You know, that is a really good question. And I think it, the way I think about it is probably where a lot of people who are, are from mixed cultures feel. We're kind of like, at least for me, I always felt like I was in no man's land, if that makes sense. You know, I had one foot in one country, one foot in the other country. And I think for a while I was even considered a dual citizen, you know, because I was born in the Philippines, but my mother's American. So I, you know, had American citizenship because of that. Mm -hmm. um and so it was interesting because when i when i was growing up as a kid i really yearned to 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 be more identified as a filipino you know what mm -hmm. i mean uh but then when i'd be in the philippines people identified me as more american you know it's it's just it's it's a strange place to be am i american or am i filipino and you know i don't think that's got to be a question that has to be answered right i think I think the whole point is that you're, you're both of them, you know, yeah. and, that, and that you can kind of create your own culture out of that. I don't have to be Filipino and I don't have to be American. I can be both. Uh, it's, it's really the, the difficulty is more not how I feel inside, but more how people reacted to me outside. You know, so yeah. if I'm in the States, especially as a kid, you know, and when you get older, you can form your own identity, your own look, your own dress, everything else like that. But, you know, from like elementary school through high school, you, you're, you're kind of pigeonholed with other people. And so um, I had a, I, I thought of myself as American growing up, you know, I thought yeah, yeah. of myself as American, uh, but it would shock me sometimes when people would respond to me like I'm not American, you know, respond to me like I'm Asian or something, right? And, and I'd be puzzled because all this time I thought that we all were the same, but you know, we're not, and that's okay too, again, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in the Philippines, uh, in the Philippines, I probably stood out even more, <laughs> especially, you know, going back there. 
uh, because I mean, I was little when, when I moved, so yeah. I don't really remember anything specific at four years old, but I went back there to, to live uh, when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, you know, I could really feel the difference when I was, even with my family who look Filipino, you know, darker skin, um, yeah. hair is a little bit straighter, you know? Um, and so I would always stand out like a sore thumb and my father, you know, would always, he'd be introducing his children. Cause you know, I have other brothers and sisters. Um, mm -hmm. and then I'd be standing there and it's like, well, who are, you know, who's this one? Like, is this the cousin, the aunt? Are you visiting the Philippines? You know, and he'd say, oh, this is my daughter, you know? And they'll be like, oh, you know, and you could just see all the questions that are popping in their mind. And again, that's only natural, you know, it's just natural. Uh, but yeah, uh, I can't say I identify with one or the other anymore. Mm -hmm. I think I'm just both and that's okay. I love that. I love and that. And that's, that's, exactly what this month specifically is about uh is all about filipino american history that's why we've really been stressing that it's filipino american history it's not just american history it's not just filipino it's both and that's a unique experience in itself sorry to the recording if you heard that Doo -doo! it is my laptop because we are recording off of my laptop right now so i'm sorry if we spooked you it spooked me <laughs> spooked but um yes Thank you. We loved all of that. Love hearing that content. I totally relate to the people asking like, oh, what's going on here when you visit the Philippines? Um, uh, some of the, the less like filtered old ladies who I would meet up with at Tai Chi would be like, oh, say something in Tagalog that I didn't understand. And then they'd ask me half read. And I'm like, <laughs> one lola. <laughs> which is like, uh, yes, yes, ma'am, kind of thing. So it's just it's quite awkward. But, you know, you, you learn to grow up and embrace it. And I think that's something that's really cool that you've embraced both sides of your culture. And I love that. Yeah, I mean, you have to. You know, you yeah. have to. You have yeah. to. Cause, because if, if you want to live in other places, you just have to be able to, to adapt to wherever you are. It's just like me coming from New York and living in the South. It's also a very different transition. You know, when I go back to New York uh, to visit my family, they see me now as somebody from the South. Mm -hmm. But, you know, down here, people still see me as somebody from the North. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's just people like to know who they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. like to know what makes you different from them. Um, you know, it's, just, it's, just a, it's just a form of being able to communicate effectively with each other. It becomes a problem when when that becomes uh, a hindrance you know if somebody's somebody's perspective of that culture or that region that you're coming from uh, you know has a has a negative connotation to it, it that that's when you have issues you know mm -hmm. you can't move forward in your con communication and and in your relationship because somebody has stigmatized you somehow instead of just treating you uh who you are you know, mm -hmm. again, all that's just a natural reaction, but you just have to chip it away little by little, you know, yeah. and, uh, and just educate little by little, just like you guys are doing here with your show. Did you struggle with your cultural identity g growing up? Uh, yeah, like I said, you know, I thought I was just myself. I just thought I was me, Monique, you know, hanging out here in the playground with friends or whatever. And then all of a sudden somebody would point something out about you that was different from everyone. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, kids can be so cruel, you know, mm -hmm. but you, at the time, of course, it's devastating when you're a mm -hmm. kid, but then as you grow older, you just, you just have to laugh it off because, you know, I dished it out just as much as everybody else did. I mean, you know, uh, I had, I just remember this, this kid in elementary school. I think, he, I think his name was Kenny. Yeah, it had to have been Kenny. And Shout out to Kenny. Little, that's a Kenny. Wherever you are. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> well, Ken yeah. Kenny was uh, Kenny was Irish, you know, mm -hmm. and I was Filipino, right? And so we got into this little name calling thing one time, and he would call me Monkey. He'd say, Monkey Monique is what he call me, you know, and I'd call him, yeah, Kenny Kangaroo. I mean, you know, it's just <laughs> that kind of stupid stuff, right? Yeah. Now, there were, there were definitely more harsher 
derogatory uh, racial slurs thrown at me growing up. And it's funny because um, they hurt. Oh yeah, they definitely hurt. But it, sometimes I felt like I would try to deflect them somehow, you know, try to mm -hmm. just try to emotionally deflect them. But what's interesting here is that my sister, my older sister, uh, for all intents and purposes, looks more Filipino than I do. Mm -hmm. She's got the darker skin, you know, her hair mm -hmm. is thick, but it's, you know, it's on the straighter end. Uh, she looks much more Filipino than I am. And, uh, and growing up, we, we were vicious with each other. You know, we would, we would, in our, in our mm -hmm. heat of anger, we would throw out racial slurs to each other. It was crazy. Yeah. And I, and I even remember one time, oh, I, I used a good one on her boy. Woo! That I used a really bad one on her one day, and uh, not meant to be shared on radio so that we don't get pulled. But my grandmother came running down the stairs, just to let you know how bad it was. She mm -hmm. came running down the stairs because you know where that word belongs, and she grabbed me and drug me into the bathroom and shoved a bar of soap in my mouth. Mm -hmm. We were just talking this about is, bars of soap the other this day. Is what we do with that, you know, we wash that nastiness out of your mouth, you know. And I and I don't think I ever used that word again to mm -hmm. my sister. But at the same time, what made me so angry was not, not the fact that I was just caught, but the fact that she had said something to me that mm -hmm. had really triggered, you know, big racial slur to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was my retaliation. But of course, I had the bigger mouth. You know, so she said, like, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then my mother, she came flying down, grabbed me, you know, who didn't start the fight and then washed my mouth out with soap. But yeah, um, sure. You know, um, and even as a, as a, as an adult, I've had some, some folks say, you know, not so, not so kind things. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know how I look at that? They're not so kind, <laughs> you know, they're, you know. There's just some people who are just simply not going to be kind. And do I sit there and, ex and, and use my energy to try to correct them? Do I try to engage with them? Or do I just say, just walk away? Because that is almost a, a hopeless, hopeless case there because it doesn't matter. They would find mm -hmm. something, you know, mm. they're angry about something. They're disappointed about something. They're insecure about something, you know? Um, and, and that's how, that's how I deal with that. But yeah, not, not so much anymore, but definitely I've had it even as a, as an adult, some, mm -hmm. some racial things. And some of it actually came from, from down here when I moved down here. Mm -hmm. Um, but not so much anymore, at least not, not, not to my face, you know, <laughs> like we say in Brooklyn, not to my face. All right. <laughs> they might be saying things behind my back, but not to my face. Love that. Love that. All right. Well, you guys stay tuned again. We're going to be right back, but right now we're going to take a little break. All right. And we're going to be diving into history and awareness of Filipino American history and how that is something we all kind of learn eventually. So stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to class. Once again, you guys are listening to Tupac with you girls, Lauren Deschanel and Scotty Rocket. And who? That's for you. Oh, that's for me. <laughs> my boy. Magandang nang umaga. I'm trying to use all of the Tagalog I know. Who are we speaking to right now? Oh, yes. This is Professor Sakai Bagwell. From the mass communication and media, or or are we now the media and communication department? Right, that's we're all we're quite now. confused. We're all confused. Oh, I yeah. had a conversation with Professor Esther about that. Did not know what we were. <laughs> yeah, a recent catalog change is that we are media and um, communications. All right, mm-hmm. all right. We're, all right. The big, we're the Big Mac. Big, Big Mac. Big Mac. Mm-hmm. But, all right. So, yes, thank you for being here with us. We've been talking about, uh, we're celebrating right now, Filipino American History Month. We have our professor here. Us two, us three. Three pot. Three pot here tonight. And we're very excited. So, yes, we're discussing Filipino American history because it's, we're wrapping up on Filipino American History Month. And we are pre-recorded, by the way. We are quite pre-recorded today. So if things sound a little different. It is. It is. It is different. (laughs) (laughs) So, all right. So, again, Filipino-American history. Personally, for me, uh, for our listeners who are loyal, you know what's up. If you're just tuning in for the first time ever, hi, welcome. We are Tupac. Um, We are Tupac. I am... Filipino American. My mom is Filipino. My father is Caucasian. And my mom is a Filipino immigrant. And she did not know that there was a whole month celebrating Filipino American history until I told her that we were doing this this talk on this show. So, Professor, prior to this invitation, were you aware that October was Filipino American History Month? No, I am sad to say, and I even belong to some Filipino Facebook groups. I guess I didn't scroll down far enough in my feed to pick that up. But no, I did not know that. I did not know that. I am so so embarrassed and ashamed that I did not know that. (laughs) It's okay. I I actually, I'm going to be honest with you guys because we're always very honest on this show. I did not know, and I stumbled across this very accidentally. Because it was, I think, just before October hit, and I saw, like, somebody posting up on Instagram about it, like, one of the Filipino Instagram pages that I follow. And I was like, what? Filipino American History Month? I have a whole show about being POC, and I didn't know this. So here we are, talking about it, keeping you guys educated. Well, you know, it's in my calendar now. Now I know. Yeah. In October, I, I'm I'm gonna be celebrating. I'm gonna wear. I'm gonna make my husband wear his barong, and yes. I'm gonna wear, you know, my coconut fiber shirt if it still fits me somewhere in my, yes. uh, in my closet. <laughs> That's right. Yes, and I think this we we don't know about Filipino American History Month mainly because Filipino history isn't really talked about in U.S. school curriculum or just in general in your day-to-day conversation. You don't really know a lot of things about the Philippines unless you happen to have a Filipino friend. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. And we played a big part in American history, certainly yeah. in, uh, you know, World War um, Two. World War Two. that is correct. If it wasn't for the Philippines, we wouldn't have, you know, that, that standing position out in the uh, Pacific. Yes, yes. So, you know, like I barely heard about that and I heard a lot about World War II in school. And I think the only other time that I hear about the Philippines is the fact that Magellan died there. <laughs> That's it. I remember that day in class. They were you like, know yes. what? I bet you he ate some balut and that probably did it. <laughs> That's what happened. It is not what happened. Lapu Lapu killed him um, because he showed up and they were like, leave. Um, but anyway. <laughs> moving on. I remember that day in class so vividly because um, they were like, yes, he was killed in the Philippines and everybody whipped their head and looked at me in class and they were like, wow, you did that. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm like seven. 
That's always so awkward. That so oh my strange. gosh, Black History Month in school, yeah, even like, in yeah. the North. Terrible. Right, it's like what terrible. What do you have to say about that? Like if you say the word slave, everybody looks at me. Like it's so awkward. And that, my friends, is a microaggression. Boom! Make sure you listen to our last episode, and whichever episodes we have after that, just listen to our show, guys. Yeah, just listen. Quite nice. I, Tupac. I think so. But XLR. <laughs> it's not really talked about that often. So. Professor, yeah. how well versed would you say that you were in Filipino American history or Filipino history in general? Well, certainly not as a kid. And, you know, most of any information I ever received about the Philippines would have been more firsthand experience from being there or talking, you know, to, to other Filipinos who enlighten me on things. But, uh, you know, I, for one, was never one who sought historical things. You know, mm-hmm. first of all, I was always a kid who just sort of lived in the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I wasn't always intrigued with learning about history as much as I was about the culture itself. You know, um, you know the food you eat, the people you see, the places you go, that thing is, is what drew me to want to know more about the Philippines, though my father, you know, he's currently writing a book about his life, which I hope I'll be able to narrate, you know, as an audio book, that would be pretty cool. Um, And uh, what's interesting about, yeah, so what's interesting about my dad is, um, is that, you know, he, he's, uh, he's, um, he worked in the Marcos government, he was actually a deputy minister of agriculture. And so, you know, we, we had a very different kind of childhood because of that. You know, mm-hmm. he, was in, he was in politics. Though he wasn't, you know, I guess when you think of a politician, he's probably the least resemblance of a politician because of yeah. what he did. Um, but uh, so I don't recall him really talking much about, you know, Filipino history as a kid. It was maybe more about our family, you know, the, things that we mm-hmm. did in our family but uh, uh, one of his last visits he made here to the states um just out of the blue it was it was it was like a magic moment he just started talking about his childhood and i had no idea about any of this because i always just saw him as my dad the deputy mm-hmm. minister of agriculture you know mm-hmm. and not being around him 24 7 I just see him as the dad that comes visit, you know, in any kind of divorce situation, but even more so because how often does he make it to the States, you know, so those yeah. were, were rare and few, but so just one night he was here at my house and, you know, we're just drinking wine, whatever. And he just started telling me the story about what it was like to grow up in the Philippines during uh, world war. Um, I think it was world war two. Yeah. Cause it was when the Japanese had invaded his, t- his hometown. Mm-hmm. And he told me of all the things that he and his father had to do just to survive that time mm-hmm. period. And I had no idea, you know, because growing up, again, he's a politician. We we have, you know, a, a much more privileged lifestyle, you know, compared to other Filipinos and probably even Americans here uh, because we have access to many things that, uh, you know, your, your regular person wouldn't have. And so it was mm-hmm. really such an eye opener for me to 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 even think of my dad as as having struggled that way and and it also brought like a lot more respect for me to him to realize what he had to overcome you know to be Dr. Sakai that he, he is today so yeah so no I don't know a lot about the Filipino history uh, as I still try to piece together my own history my own family history yeah. you know uh, though I think it's important, and when you travel in certain parts of the Philippines, you can see some of the historical things, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, when McCarty, um, MacArthur, you know, landed, they have a big statue of him in, in, in the beach, you know, coming mm-hmm. on and is sort of the savior um, of of the Philippines at that time. But yeah, pretty fascinating. Yeah. 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 So... What is something about Filipino history or about Filipino culture that you wish you knew more about? Well, like I said, you know, learning more about what my dad struggled through, you know, I I wished, I wish I want, I was like, 
I hope he gives me more information, you yeah. know, but he, he, he yeah. didn't, you know, he just kind of told that story and told me about the things that he would have to do to earn money, to earn food, you know, and, mm -hmm. and how one night, um, uh, I, I, I'm guessing it was the Japanese uh, had invaded his, uh, his village at that time and they all had to escape to the mountains and um, some of his friends and family or something were, were, were still there and they saw from the mountaintop the whole village go on fire you know and there wasn't anything they could do about it wow you know uh, and knowing that you had you know friends and family in there I can just imagine how that formed his mind because my father is a very ambitious man, but he's also very much, um, uh, very prideful about being a Filipino. You know, he's the kind of guy that if we're at a reunion in the Philippines, people would bring their children to him or they would go to him and they'd approach him and they'd say, you know, oh, hello, Dr. Sakai. And it, it was very humbling. And they would tell him, you know, my son is wanting to go to college, blah, blah, blah. And he'd say, okay, well, just, you know, give me the information and he would help. He would help pay for some of their college. That's the kind of guy he was, you know, so, or is. So he always gave back to his community, always, always. And, uh, and even the things that he did there, entrepreneurial. So he has um, some resorts. He's, you know, had resorts. Um, he was very committed to making sure that he maintained the natural environment, you know. Uh, he was big into preserving the the beauty of the philippines you know uh, especially with his agricultural background uh so you know he so he's actually a really earthy guy even though it, the stories he could tell you about traveling and all the different people that he met uh would just blow your mind uh, but at, at the end of the day you know stick him in the beach put a hat on him you know give him some mangoes <laughs> Love that. Give him some fish and he he's good. He's good. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So when you were talking to your father, did you just have one of those moments where you just wanted to soak up everything? I have those moments with my grandmother a lot because she grew up during the civil rights movement and she was really young during that time. So I will usually find out like pieces of black history and then ask her and see if she knows or just to see like her side of it like do you have like that kind of moment where you were just like wow you oh, lived yeah. through oh absolutely i was just like i said he never really revealed anything about his youth to me i only knew him as dr sakai my dad who you know mm -hmm. worked with marcos and you know drove fancy cars or whatever right but mm -hmm. i never knew about that that part of that struggle and um yeah, and, and, and it's just the sensations that you get from listening to those stories, you know, it, it's, it really brings you there, like, you know, you just feel like you're there watching through their eyes, a part of you, you're not even born yet, but it's like, you know, your, your, your spirit self is in there somehow. And, yes, uh, it does feel like that. Mm -hmm. and, you do, and you really do, you just, want to, you just want to hear more, but you also, you're also respectful not to push it because, you know, some people have painful memories and sometimes they don't want to remember. You know, mm -hmm. my grandfather uh, fought um, in the war um, when, uh, when um, Franco was invading Spain mm -hmm. and he went and joined these volunteers called the Lincoln Brigade. And there was also the International Brigade and it was nicknamed the Good Fight. Uh, and they mm -hmm. went over there to stop Franco from invading this Spanish town. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and this is before he was married, you know, this is before he met my grandmother when he was a young man, of course. And when he came back, he never talked about it really. And then mm -hmm. he was in his um, 70s and, and somebody was trying to do an autobiography about that war. And he was looking for all the survivors, you know, that, that were still alive. And so he came to our house to interview my grandfather. And that was the first time my grandfather spoke about it. And in the middle of it, he just started crying. And I'd never seen him cry before, mm -hmm. you know? So, so sometimes those memories, you know, can be cleansing and they can also be very painful. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
you know, he was reliving things that he had compartmentalized, you know, mm -hmm. just so that he can carry on with, with his life. But yeah, there's a lot of stories, I'm sure, that could, yes. could be shared. But like I said, I try, I try not to press. And so I'm really thrilled that he's writing this book about his life. You yes. know, because I have a feeling I'm going to learn, <laughs> I'm going to learn a lot more about my dad. Yeah. I'm honestly very excited for this book. Like, I didn't know that this was a development. I want to. When this, this happens, he's getting all of my money. Um, we will promote it on absolutely. everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, we can document it when you start recording the audio books. So. Yeah. Yeah. I tell him, dad, you better hurry up. You know, you're no spring chicken. You got to get this done. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of it is, uh, you know, COVID because he's yeah. housebound. He's housebound yeah. right now. So this is helping keeping him from being bored out of his mind. So he's writing this book. Yeah. yeah. Look Absolutely. forward to, to reading it. Mm -hmm. We are too. And you guys will be too. We're looking forward to a lot of things and you should be looking forward to the rest of this episode. For right now, we're going to go ahead and take another break. Who are they listening to, Lauren? Tupac on XLR, Lander University Radio. What we do here is go back, 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 back. back. Welcome back to class. You are listening to Tupac on XLR, Lander University Radio. It's your girl, Lauren Deschanel, and your other girl, Scotty Rocket. And our other girl, Professor MSB. I love, I love that. that. I love yes. that so much. Yes. Yes. Oh, that was nice. We got to take a second to just, just all just, simultaneously just do one singular clap for that. All right. One, two, three. Nice. All yes. right. Back nice. on. So we are talking about Filipino American history because it is Filipino American History Month. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Our professor here is Filipino American, just like I am. And so we're talking about it. And boom, she's boom, boom. biracial, just she like is. we are. Yes. So, hi, welcome to 3 Pac. <laughs> three pot. Three pot. Now, Lauren is going to be really taking the reins on this one because this one is very special to Lauren, this, this chunk of, of speak. Yes? <laughs> this chunk of speak. Chunk of speak. May I have some <laughs> chunk of speak? May I have some speak? Please. <laughs> okay, so if anyone has met Professor MSB, you might notice something about her that is a big part of her personality. It is her curls. The curls. The curls. I'm not speaking French with you. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Our listeners know that Lauren hates French. I don't hate French. I just have a lot of French homework every week. And it's a lot. <laughs> so, I have curly hair. You have curly hair. Let's talk about it. 
So All right, let's let's what you want to know. So your hair is is a big part of your personality. Is there a reason behind that? Uh, it, 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 it's something that I actually hid for a long time. You know, if you look at some of my early uh, pictures of, of growing up as a kid, as a little kid, you could see the curls, you know, uh, but by the time I had anything to do with my physical appearance, um, I wanted, again, to look like all the other girls. And mm -hmm. there were my friends mostly, you know, Caucasian girls, you know, even though they're Jewish or this and that, it was mostly Caucasian girls, uh, you know. And so I didn't want to stand out in, and be different. So I was all into the Farrah Fawcett hair. And I would sit there with the curling iron and the blow dryer, and I would just pull, pull, pull and straighten my hair until I had to know what I thought were flips, but they probably just look like two round, I don't know, like some, like I stuck some paper towel rolls in my head or something, you know, but in my mind, I thought they were the feathered look, you know, the feathered look where you would just spin your hair and the hair would just spin around like that. And so, uh, so yeah, and my sister's hair was a lot straighter than mine. She had, she had, she had wave, she did have wave, mm -hmm. but overall it was straighter than mine. So I spent a lot of time doing that and it wasn't until I was in high school that I actually let it just be more natural you know without the pulling and the drying and I used to even straighten my hair like I used to get it chemically straightened mm. I did that too been there mm -hmm. yeah. it's not good yeah. no and you know you lose hair you know after a while when you do when you do things like that so it I just maybe it's because I was in the Philippines and it's hot and it's, you know, maybe just easier to go natural. I don't know what it was, but I just eventually just started going natural. And what was interesting about that is people, like you just said, started to identify me with my hair when I was in high school, uh, the girl with the curly hair, even more so in the Philippines because there weren't that many people with yeah with curls and if they did if they were filipino most of the time it was because it was you know a perm right mm -hmm. uh to be curly so and that was it and after that i just said well i'm just gonna you know keep it curly and my hair used to be a little bit longer you know than it is now i think i cut it after i started having children because you just don't want your hair and everything <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so i would cut you know i cut it a little bit shorter uh, but yeah, it has become my brand, in fact, for voiceover. Yeah. Remember, I, was, I think I told you guys this in class. It took me yeah. a long time to figure out what is my brand? What is, what's going to make me stand out? And you have to sit there and go, well, what is it? What is the first thing people see about me? And I go, okay, my hair, my hair, all right, my hair. And then I said, well, what can I say about my hair? And, I, and, I, and inevitably, somebody will always ask me, is it, are your curls natural? You know, that's all, you know, you know, you know, you know, I have to say, if there was, if there was a, if there was a trigger point or a micro, would you call it micro trigger? Microaggression. Microaggression. It would be that, not what am I? It would be, we is my hair natural? No, yeah. I don't, you know, I don't care if they ask me, you know, what's my nationality, but when they ask me, is your hair natural? That's my microaggression right there, you know, but um, yes, it is natural. And, uh, and so I, I'm just always asked that question. And so I said, all right, people are always asking me that question. And what do I always say? Well, yeah, it, it's natural. And so at first I was going to say, um, as natural as her curls was my original thing. But then I, I decided, mm, natural, let me go with genuine, as genuine as her curls. I thought that gave a little bit more of a personality. Thing. Genuine as her curls. <laughs> <laughs> we may or may not have stalked the website. Who knows? No, so, yes. So that's where the brand came from. And and yes, my hair, my hair is definitely part of that. And it's mm -hmm. interesting because both my kids and uh, my boys have uh curly hair. Mm -hmm. And my husband's got curly hair. And they'll always, you know, they'll they ask my boys too, you know, as they grow up, where'd you get that hair? Or is that mm -hmm. hair real? I mean, you know, and they would look at my husband and they would think that they got it from my husband even though I'm standing there with curly hair they would always assume that I was the one who had the perm oh, wow. even though even though my hair they would assume that the boys got their curls just from their father and mm -hmm. not from me you know and you know my daughter my daughter Hannah I don't know if you know Hannah you know Hannah uh was adopted 
and uh, from the Philippines. Oh. And she has straight hair, right? And when she first saw a picture of us, before we met her officially, she saw that we had curly hair and she actually asked um, my family if she needed to get a perm. Aww. Aww. Aww, Hannah. Aww. You don't yeah. need a perm. Because she wanted, she wanted to fit in so badly, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so she was like, oh, well, you know. And if, for a while, now that we're here, most people realize that, you know, she, we adopted a, a daughter and blah, blah, blah. But uh, for the longest time, when we would go places where people didn't know we were doing an adoption and there's there's Anna with us you know she's like smack dab in the middle of the, the boys in terms of age they go yeah. oh yeah oh yeah you know and this is a typical southern thing too you know can't mm-hmm. deny those kids you heard that expression can't deny those two you know they'll look at mm-hmm. my boys and say well you can't deny those two and then they look at Hannah like and who are you <laughs> like, oh yeah <laughs> but you know she Bless her, bless her heart. She took it all in stride. You know, she's, yeah. a, she's a really strong girl and, and uh, it didn't deter her yeah. from being part of like the a, family. That's kind of like a full circle moment, how like you would straighten your hair as a kid to like fit in right. with other girls. And now Hannah wants to fit in with the family. That's, that's such a crazy like full circle moment. And I'm, I'm so yeah, glad. But you know, I told her, I said, Hannah, I don't want you to have curly hair because I always wanted straight hair. You know, so yeah. now I have, you know, somebody's hair that can be played with in different ways because you can only yeah. do so many things with curly hair. You know, a lot of people always say, oh, I wish I had curly. Oh, I wish I had curly hair as though as though that's it. I, I think people think I wake up and I, and I look like this. No, when you have curls, it's like, you know, it smushes. Oh. It's, you know, I, I, you know, unless I had really, really, really thick hair. But even then, like my son, my oldest mm-hmm. son is he's got kinky curls like his is really tight tight curls and Mm -hmm. he he can't even wear a hat you know what Mm -hmm. i'm saying because when you take the hat off his hair (laughs) shakes to the hat oh you know so um yeah so there's pros and cons to all kinds of things in life right so we always want what somebody else doesn't that what we always want we always want what we don't have is what i wanted to say yeah Mm -hmm. mm-hmm mm-hmm Mm-hmm. were you subject to teasing when it comes to your curls so my mom she has natural curls because she's biracial she's black and white and people used to tease her in school for her curls i think she said someone tried to cut her hair off on the school bus did you ever experience anything like that um <laughs> uh, mm. Well, okay, so this this kind of reveals a little something here. One day when I was skipping classes oh. in uh, middle school, okay, everybody skips classes in middle school, don't they? <laughs> Do they? Um, I'm not going to. I didn't skip classes. Well, I did. I was pretty okay. bad about that, too. Um, <laughs> and I was hanging out with probably what people would term juvenile delinquents. Um, and uh, this guy was... Uh, about to smoke a cigarette <laughs> and he had a lighter and he reached out and he set my <gasps> hair on fire oh my, God. my gosh yeah that was that was the first time my hair was set on fire the first? first how many times yeah. did this happen uh just just twice because you know just how twice. many times how many times do you have to have your hair set on fire before you start avoiding fire <laughs> <laughs> Like even even like you know July Fourth, I stay away from the fireworks. I will I will literally sit under an umbrella. You, mm-hmm. you know my my kids laugh at me, but then when they started getting hit in the head, you know, by the falling fireworks, I had a lot of people holding umbrellas. I was like, this ain't yeah. this ain't funny, people. If that thing hits your head, it's singe time. And the, the second time was purely accidental. Mm-hmm. Purely oh. accidentally, I it was uh, Christmas Eve, and we oh, were no. we went to midnight service, and mm-hmm. you know how everybody lights candles, oh. you know. And this is back in New York, and I was oh, no. like, you know, young young college age woman, and we were singing "Joy to the World," and we're walking out of the church. Everybody's holding their candles, and all of a sudden, I felt somebody hit the back of my head, like whack, whack 
whack. And I had no idea. You know, I thought, oh my God, who's, who's beating me up? I'm singing Joy to the World. I'm getting beat up here. And it was my, my aunt had gotten too close as we were Oh, beyond family. Beyond family. <laughs> be your own family. Set my hair on fire and was oh, my beating goodness. Out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So there's pros and cons to curly hair. Would, would I That's trade it now? <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, if, if somebody asked me now, like, all right, Monique, if you want, you now can have straight hair. Would you have it? And I'd say, nope. Nope. I'm good. I'm good. In fact, sometimes when I really want to fool people, like I'll have my hairdresser dry my hair straight. And it's funny how people don't recognize me. They really don't. Mm -hmm. They really don't. I even have a colleague that now, now, for all fairness, I actually wore a straight wig, you know, like uh -huh. a straight, kind of the Asian cut, right? The straight yeah. on the side, the bob with the, the yeah. band, right? I put this wig on and I walked right into his office and he's, he's not a colleague of mine anymore. And I was stood in his office for a good couple of minutes, just looking at him. And he looked up and he totally looked like he didn't know me. He's like, uh, yes, can I help you? And I went, <laughs> I'm like, you don't know who I am. And his face was like, <gasps> <laughs> oh it's, man yeah um, so the the hair really does you know identify a person and when you when you take that away you're like a totally different person mm -hmm. all right all right stay tuned because we're not going anywhere we are pre-recorded though so we're not really here all <laughs> right we will be right back with tupac on xlr lander university radio <laughs> Thank you. 
Mabuhai! Welcome back to Tupac. I'm your guest today, Professor MSB, and our hosts are... Us! Us! It's your girl, Lauren Deschanel, and Scotty Rocket on XLR, Lander University Radio. Boom! Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to class. We are coming here up at the top of the hours. The end of the hour. The end of the hour. <laughs> We're coming up at the top of the next hour, but we won't be here for the next hour. So, hi. <laughs> nice to see you guys. We can't see you. Nice to listen to you guys. We can't listen to you because this is pre recorded. Hello. We also can't do roll call. <laughs> we can't do roll call. So, if you've been commenting live, I promise we're looking at it. We just haven't talked about it because we're not, we're not live. Speaking of commenting, we will be in the station. Not mm -hmm. us, but future us. Future us. So if you uh. would like to please, you know, send us a little message. You can text us if you have our numbers. If you don't, we are on Instagram and our DMs are always open at 2POCXLR. We're also on Twitter. Yes, also at 2POCXLR. In fact, all of our social media is like that. So if you go on a social media platform and type in 2POCXLR, if you don't see it, we don't have it. But otherwise, we're there. Yes, check us out. So, moving on. It is the end of Filipino American History Month, and that's what we've been talking about today. Nice. All right. So, we're gonna we're gonna kind of close in this show with some final thoughts. You know, some some feelings checks. Some uh, just a whole bunch of things. Lauren just told me that we don't have a quote, but that's okay because I have a plan. Got you. Yes. But anyway, moving on. We do talk to ourselves, like, secretly that you guys don't see. It's a whole secret thing. We are ninjas. We have Google Docs. <laughs> we, <laughs> we are ninjas, I With think. With Google Docs. <laughs> <laughs> also, you may have noticed that there was no random Whitney Houston fun fact. That's because I don't know when we will be playing Whitney Houston. But if it was just now, Whitney Houston used to model before she was a singer. Mm -hmm. That's your fun fact. Fun fact. Yes. Just brought that up so randomly. <laughs> this is a, this is pre-recorded. We've never done this. We have not been playing any music. I just wanted to say it. Yes. And once again, our professor here is our very first guest. How have you been feeling doing this show? Man, I'm having a great time. I've really been enjoying sharing some stories and, and hearing and watching you guys. You're such a team. I am so impressed. Your <laughs> other professors would be very proud of you right now. Aww. I'm going to go cry. I'm going to cry after this, but you not now. You do care. You do care. Virtual hugs. Virtual hugs. <laughs> Shout out to Microsoft Zoom. No, I lied. Shout out to Zoom. We were on Teams, but you weren't good enough for us. So shout out to Zoom. You can't call them out like that. The FCC will find us. No, they might not. Shout out to Zoom for, <laughs> for hosting our little platform today for us to record and then upload later to our beautiful station, XLR Landy University Radio. It's because of you and technology that we were able to pre-record this far away i think you should grade this because that was a great commercial tell you what i know it what is the usp there folks <laughs> oh we can connect from far away that was also far away yeah it. and it was real person <laughs> yeah it was real person okay, yeah cool. it was raw these are things that we're talking about in class that's because right. she is actually our professor. That's we saw right. her earlier today. She's not just a professor. She's our, our professor. professor. That's correct. And she can be yours too. Join MassCom. Join Mass Communications for or the low, low price of something. Yeah. Join the Big Mac. Remember, we're the Big Mac. Yes. Here at Lander University, the school for you. 
XLR, Lander University Radio. Radio. Your voice, your people, your station. We are just rambling. We are just rambling. But we are here at the end of the hour. Bird walking. <laughs> this is why we have pins. But at the end of the hour, we're talking about what matters. It's this show and the people in it and the people listening, which is you guys. Nice. <laughs> I hope you, that, that was a little pause for you guys to. Wow. Oh. Wow, you guys do care. We do, we do. Because if don't nobody else care, Tupac Tupac cares. cares. And that's from Keep Your Head Up. Boom. By Tupac. Not us. The artists. (laughs) We're rambling. (laughs) Where does this energy come from? I don't know. But, all right, let's get on (laughs) We literally just did like... Why did we just wrap up? That was five minutes worth of promotional and introductions. (laughs) But, nice. So, over... Over this past two-ish hours, we've been talking about, like, who you are, who we are, you know, how we identify, what, what culture we love and appreciate and are still learning to love and appreciate, and uh, just, just so many things, so many things. And we kind of wanted to talk about your career, really. Can I ask the question? Yes, of course. I was going to le- let you lead into that. Okay. So, so intrusive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we wanted to talk about your career. Lauren. What's it like being biracial in the industry you're in, both at Lander and when it comes to acting and voiceover? Okay, that, that, that's a good question because it kind of goes back to what I had said earlier about how we view ourselves and how other, view, other people view us. So when I decided to go into acting, you know, I never really thought of myself as being biracial. You know, mm-hmm. I just thought of all the great roles that I could play, right? Mm-hmm. And so whenever I was cast in things, I never ever saw myself as, oh, how do I play this Caucasian woman? for example. Mm-hmm. You know, I would just play the character and whatever I was, was. Uh, mm-hmm. I, it never really held me back from trying to audition for things. Like I never thought, well, gee, I'm, I'm Amory Asian. I'm, I'm not going to try out for that role. Unless it's specifically said they were looking for blonde hair, blue eyes or something else, I would, I would try out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I was pretty fortunate in terms of my Um, theater background and my uh, academic background of just how diverse the roles were that I was uh, able to play because you know directors that I worked with also didn't see me as Amor Asian you know they just Mm -hmm. saw me as a good actress Mm -hmm. and you know once you put all the makeup on and everything else I'm not saying that people didn't sit in the audience go is she is she is she Amerasian? You know, and does that seem right? And, you know, there's always going to be people who are going to question that. And I think when you think about a show like Hamilton, for example, and all the diversity there, um, I think more, people, more people probably expect to see that diversity. But you see, mm-hmm. for me, my training and, and, and um, the, the things that I learned was that you have to first respect the script as it's written, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. before you start playing around with it right? Mm-hmm. Because there's actually legal things associated with that. Mm-hmm. So you can't just cast a play because this is something you want to be diverse. If the author specifically says, don't do that, you know, because it could take away from the, the meaning of the script as it was originally intended to, to be communicated. So mm-hmm. for example, if you take a play like Raisin in the Sun by mm-hmm. Lorraine Hansberry, there's only one white character in the entire play. The rest of it is, you know, African American, Black American, and talking about, um, you know, their survival and 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 the world that they lived in. But let's say I said, you know what, I want to play around. I'm going to mix the cast here. Mm-hmm. The message would be lost. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You know, mm-hmm. so so I try to respect the message right mm-hmm. before I, I I play around with things. But you know, a play like for Colored Girls who considered suicide after the rainbow mm-hmm. the title. Uh, we direct, I directed that here at Lander years ago. And, um, uh, and I cast it all as, you know, African and um, American ladies. And one night, one of my cast members didn't show up. She couldn't show up. She had an emergency. She wasn't going to be there. And my stage manager was really needed. She was a good actress, but she was really needed to be the stage manager. So I said, I'll do it. <laughs> 
So that was the only time I've ever stepped into a role in anything I've directed because usually, mm-hmm. you know, I wouldn't do that. And I had the most fun in during that show. And when I came out to introduce the show before we got started, you know, hi, welcome to Lander University and to our show. And I said, so sit back, relax and watch four colored girls and one white chick. <laughs> And one white chick because it was four f o r but there were actually four you know colored girls now and one white chick so you know mm-hmm. I just, so and everybody just laughed because it was obvious that i was <laughs> the colored girl in there right and oh my gosh we had a blast me and the cast and of course i had my script because i didn't memorize any of it but it was okay because we did it like readers theater so it worked out really yeah. well uh so you know i don't i i Interestingly enough, never had any issues with that. And it's funny because I don't know if you're familiar with uh, um, Miss Saigon, the musical. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Or, um, we are musical theater fans. Yeah, the actress, Leia Salonga. Yes. Um, I actually met Leia Salonga when she was like 10 years old. Wow. I, wow. Yeah, I was in the Philippines and we were doing a show called Godspell, which most people know. And we were taking it to the Philippine Folk Art, Folk Art Center and we were performing it during Holy Week in the Philippines. And so the producer wanted to, us to really promote. So we would go to all of the, the game shows and all the interview shows in the Philippines and we'd, you know, pop in and say, oh, look, here's the cast from Godspell, you know, and I'd sing day by day for everybody, you know, all that kind of stuff. And Leia Salonga happened to be on this show, on this game show. And she was like 10 years old. She wore this very white starched dress, you know, with a ribbon around her waist and a big bow in her hair. I mean, totally <laughs> different from what you would think of her as today. And she was the Clem girl. Mm-hmm. Clem milk spelled backwards. It was like powdered milk. And her yes. song, I love milk so rich and so creamy. You know, and that was she that was her little song. That's how we knew her as the Clem oh. girl. And look at her. She's like a Broadway, you know, actress. But she capitalizes on the fact that she's Filipino. Mm-hmm. You know, I think she was in Les Mis, wasn't she? And she played the the girl who loves him or something, and then dies. I think she was in that as well. Yeah. Uh, but um, so I don't know how much diversity she's experienced because I'm thinking most of the roles that she's played on Broadway were Asian related. In fact, mm-hmm. here's, here's you're talking about coming full circle. You mentioned earlier, I auditioned for Miss Saigon. Oh. Yeah. The, hey. line, the line was around the corner of, of Asian people, you know, and we got on stage, sang my little 16 bars, you know, but they had already planned on hiring Leia Salonga, but Actors' Equity demanded that they also um, audition people from New York. It was a whole big issue of London and New York kind of thing. And here's a funny little story to tell you. So I was going on another audition while I was living back home in New York. And it specifically said, we're looking for an Asian woman for such and such. So I went in and and I knew in my head that I looked Amer Asian. So I spent a lot of time on my makeup, (laughs) emphasizing, you know, as much as I could, you know, the pointiness of my eyes. I was, you know, wore a lot of base to try to you know Mm -hmm. get a little bit more of a smoother tone type of thing and I'm sitting there and this other girl was sitting there who was completely Asian I mean she was Asian and I pulled my hair I pulled my hair all the way back into Mm -hmm. like you know tried to make it a tight bow so you wouldn't really see the curls and the guy comes out and he looks at me and he looks at her he goes I'm sorry you don't really look very Asian and so it's kind of funny in that way because uh-huh. Some people, I, I do look Asian because I've had other directors when I'd say, well, how do I look? You know, I'd say, how do I look? How, how does it? And, and they would joke around. They say, oh, you look like, you know, an Asian woman with this, you know, just like as a joke. And so, yeah, it's so funny that way because there's sometimes you, you see yourself as that. And then there's other times people don't see you as that. So, but I've been very fortunate to have been able to play a really wide variety of roles as uh, as a stage actress but now as a voiceover actress it's just whatever's out there you know because nobody sees you nobody knows you mm-hmm. nobody can uh, evaluate you how you look but on the flip side that's actually changing in voiceover because now 
clients are more sensitive about the fact that they want voices out there who uh, who who uh, can be identified with other populations. So it'll specifically say African American, or it'll say you know gender neutral. I mean, before they wouldn't say anything like that, but you, know, you mm -hmm. notice that more and more, and even actors who have been currently playing roles that were uh, culturally or racially different from them have stepped down from those mm -hmm. roles. So mm -hmm. it opens it up to people of, of color or minorities, you know, to take on those roles that may not have been available to them before. So it's interesting, very interesting. Yes, yes. Ah, so we are, I, thank you for all of that. Love thank that. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. We are actually coming up on the actual end of the hour here, guys, the end of our two hours here. So we, we just want to, first of all, plug our social media real quick. Uh, follow us on any social media we have. Uh, so we have Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and YouTube. You can hit us up at 2POCXLR. That's the number two, 2POCXLR. And hit us up on our website. We have a whole website. It's www.2poc.weebly.com. Again, that's www.2poc.weebly.com. Would you please plug your own website here? Oh, of course, yes. If anybody would like any more information about the kind of work that I do, uh, you are welcome to visit my webpage at www.moniquebagwell.com. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We will absolutely be posting those links up as well, just in case you can't you can't get there. Okay, we got you, we got you, got you. Tupac <laughs> cares. Tupac cares. Ain't right. nobody care. Tupac so cares. instead of doing a quote of the week from a celebrity or a famous figure, we would like to give our quote of the week to Professor MSB. After we ask you this question. Mm -hmm. If you can inspire just one student and make them feel represented, what would you like for them to know? If I can inspire one student to make them feel represented, what would I want them to know? That at the heart and soul of it, we are all human. And we are all represented because of that. That's what ties us all together. 